Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming here. It's, it's a little cool, so I'm sorry about the weather. Um, so I don't know if you know anything about Div, who is here, but many things are interesting. One of the things that probably is interesting no. is that he is a self-made billionaire. Fine, no, thank you. Um, but yeah. At 34? 34 years old, he made his first billion. Um, and he started with just $500. It's like, at this point, so I would like to know how one turns $500 into a billion. Well, of course, it takes time. Oh. <laughs> uh, there are no shortcuts. Um, the, so I started when I was really, really young. Uh, this is, um, I started working when I was 14. Uh, I started my first company when I was 16, with 500 bucks. Uh, uh, it was a domain registration and hosting company. And the idea then was, uh, I was in, I wanted to do something in the internet space, this was 1998. Uh, I was out of India, I was based out of India back then. Um, in two logical businesses that made sense, that had money, was either start an ISP or uh, start a hosting company, and both of those would be volume based as compared to doing something that would involve custom consulting, which is not as scalable. Uh, and that's essentially what I started, and then uh, 14 years later, I think. About 14 years later, I sold that for 160. Yeah, I. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, along the way, I started many different businesses, and in, uh, uh, in each one of those, the idea was uh, how do I leverage what I already have uh, and build on top. So I think if you want to start, it's not anywhere. I mean, I think most people, and I've met many, many founders, most people are capable of incredible things. So as long as you're willing to. Take the time, know that there are no shortcuts, you're not going to do this overnight. Uh, if you really want to build a cool business, it's going to take you at least a decade or so to get there. At least, because in, at least in tech, if you're building a good software platform, it's going to take you at least five years before your platform is really cool. So for the first five years, all you're doing is adding, adding, adding various different things. And then, uh, what, what you're trying to figure out along the way is how do you fund that? In, at least in, in, in my case, uh, because I bootstrapped and I didn't raise money for each of these different businesses, uh, uh, the idea was how do we keep building such that we can get a customer to pay for each of these functions or uh, and features, uh, so that they're kind of funding it. Uh, and that also allows us to sort of not just build uh, without talking to anybody, we're building for a specific customer, and then we're productifying it. Uh, and as we keep doing that, adding to the function set within any product line, uh, eventually you get to a point where um, you know the, the platforms become much larger, and that's that's the mode between you and your competition, uh, especially in tech, because a, a lot of the large companies have money. But if you spend a lot of time building your platform and it's large and in, in, in scalable, uh, the idea is, uh, you know, if, if your competition is one of the big boys, uh, if they need 100 plus developers to spend a couple of years to get with the same functionality, um, they would rather figure out how to partner with you or buy you or, or do something else. So, so that's essentially the mode that you're trying to build. Did you have mentors along the way? You know, did you have any business background? You were, what, 15? I would, I, 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 so I started young. Uh, I would say that from a mentor's perspective, uh, I read a lot. I read, and I, I would suggest that everybody else obviously uh, should do the same. That well, learning. Which, which Give us a book. Give us I don't like giving one or two because it's never one or it's never two books. Keep in mind that, uh, so I average, we spend maybe about uh, 800 hours a year reading. Um, in I've done that for the last 20 plus years. Uh, and then, as far as business books are concerned, you can speed read a lot. So you, you flip through them as fast as possible, get the concepts, uh, learn from as many people as possible. And when I say learn from as many people, they don't need to mentor you in person, right? If, if someone's written a great book and you can easily find a list of amazing books on whatever topic you're interested in, or wherever you think that you can learn more or you would basically, uh, there's some, functionalities that you can know more about or there's some things that you don't know how to do today, pick up the, 
top five books off an Amazon list uh, within that topic. In, in, uh, at the end of that process, you kind of know it. And then you keep trying various things out. And, uh, um, you know, in time, you will get better and better at it. Um, nobody starts out being good at everything. Um, everybody kind of sucks at it the first few times you do it. Uh, but eventually, once you do it for the hundred times, you're going to be awesome at it. Well, we're up now. We, I just, I just shoehorned myself into his business. We are up at how many businesses we are, we're at now? Seven. I uh, so the media network was my seventh business that I exited. Seventh business. And so you have businesses, companies all over the world, right? Because yep. you're based in Dubai, and then you're also in LA. Yep. You're also in. Uh, you have an office here in New York. You have an office here in New York. So how do you do that? How do you manage everything? I know you, you spend most of your time on an airplane. Oh, yeah, I think, I, well, tool, the tools available today are way better than they used to be, right? So uh, we use uh, a lot of video. Uh, we use team messengers. Uh, we have one internally that we uh, we use uh, called Flock, uh, which is one of the uh, startups that within our group itself, uh, which is pretty awesome. And if you haven't tried it, you should try it. It's a great team messenger. Uh, it keeps the group together because we have, in media we have a thousand plus people across some of these other businesses. We have a couple of hundred people each. Uh, so it kind of helps to be able to uh, communicate and everybody's diff across different locations and time zones. So uh, having the right tools is kind of important. Uh, but also having the right kind of people. So as you build out your team, in, and I've done this a bunch of times, where I bootstrapped, I started with like my initial team of less than 20 people, grew that to 50 people, grew that to 200 people, grew that to 1,000 plus people. Uh, and, and, and the reason I mentioned it in that particular form is as these are the, the these are the, the places where, or at, at the 20 people point, or at the 50 people point, or the 200 people point, the way you manage completely changes. So when you are a 20 people startup, you know everybody that works for you. Everybody reports into you directly. Uh, you know their names. You likely know their families, and you manage differently because you also have access to limited resources. So the kind of talent that you have in the the things that you do to keep that talent is different from when you put into place your first layer of management and you get to the 50 people uh, size in, and then when you get from 50 to 200 you've got you know layer 2 and layer 3 so you stop knowing everybody you might still know the names of most people but you stop knowing everybody and somewhere after 200 now you know even less than the number of people because once you get to a thousand maybe you know the 30 people that directly work with you in some form you just don't know everybody else so what you want to do along the way is figure out uh, how do you automate as many things as possible? What are the key metrics that you want to continue to monitor on an ongoing basis? Because that's really, really important. Like, what are the key criteria? What are the things that you want to focus on? What do you want to know daily? What do you want to know weekly so that you can keep making tweaks uh, to manage that part of the business? And, uh, uh, and that's sort of how we think through it. We talked about the idea of being the smartest person in the room, right? Okay. What do you think? Well, the other we were talking about that. What do you think? Is it do you hire people who are smarter than you are? Do you hire so always hire. Try and hire people that are smarter than you at the function that they're supposed to be doing, right? Because everybody's smart at something, and you can't be smart at everything. Hey, that's a given, right? But there's so much knowledge out there that it's it's impossible that during our tiny lifespan of what 90, 100 years that we can learn everything about everything. So it's. It's obvious that there will be people that know a lot more than you about, so identify your core strengths first. If you are, like in my case, I'm really good at tech, I'm really good with operation efficiency, I'm really good with capital allocation. I'm not the best sales and marketing guy, I am not necessarily the best at various other things. So you, you, I mean, you need to identify what your core strengths are and then hire, initially hire around you to fill the, the core sets of functionality that you need to run the business that you don't have. So if you are a great business person, you need a tech partner. If you are a great business person who has a tech partner, you still need a great finance partner. So identify the right folks that you want to add to your team initially and and, and keep figuring out what are the holes and keep plugging them in. Another thing that I've realized is, uh, so as we hire, and that's been, I would say the single most important thing, and there is no single most important thing when you're running a business, but the single most important thing, if there was one, if there was one. Uh, would be, uh, the team that you can continue to build and how you can you know, manage it. So, to, to your point, in, in you're talking about this, when we're recruiting, the, the main thing that we're looking for is, uh, are they really smart? 
and can they get things done? Because there are lots of really smart people that may not actually get things done because that's not what they want to do. They want to just focus on what they want to do and that might not be getting what you need done. So it needs to be a combination of both of those. Another thing that I've realized building businesses over the long term is you really want to figure out how to get people that will be with you long term. So for example, if you're recruiting and we recruit out of campus, we're also trying to identify who are the people where we would be the best fit long term for them and how can we add value to them such that they will be with us for the next 5, 10, 15 years. And that's really important in a tech company and a products company. And it's more important than hiring the smartest guy. So if you you know, you're, you you have 10 options and one of them is the smartest but will be with you for a year versus uh, you know, number three who's going to be with you long term, you'd rather hire number three because uh, in a products company, it's not just about being smart, it's about the accumulated knowledge over the long term that's going to continue to add that value. So it's really important that you figure out how to find people that are smart, find people that get things done, find people that will be with you long term. And a lot of that has to do with how do you manage and how do you make sure that they continue to grow and they can you know, meet their potential and they continue to get the right set of challenges so that they can grow into that. Uh, ongoing. It's fine. It's just a palm tree that's my <laughs> gone and It's fine. They've got our back. Um, okay, so how do you do that? Do you offer, you know, how Google has its innovation days or do you offer things like that? that I mean, there, are, there, are different, there are different things that are offered to different kinds of people, right? So, uh, the tech people need different things from finance people, from sales people, from marketing people. So, everybody is not the same. You need to understand what the quirks are. And, and as you continue to scale, you'll realize that you'll, you'll work with all kinds of people uh, in, in the, all kinds of personalities and you, you, know, you just need to figure out how to manage that. What's interesting about yeah, you is that, the, that oh, say yeah, not risk not adverse, right? I mean, I'm, I, I am, as in, I'm not as much of a risk taker. Right. But nonetheless, and because this is called Propeller Fund, I feel compelled to let you know that he, for fun, walks on airplane wings, where he just kind of, you know, goes around and, I don't know, hangs out on a wing. I don't quite get it. But that seems to me slightly risky. Actually, that's that's almost zero risk. Uh, uh, in, in some, sometimes, sometimes you'll realize that uh, when you look at something, the perceived risk of that might be really high. But when you learn enough about it, uh, then you're, you're figuring out how to remove the risk factors. And that's how it works in business also, right? The idea is there is always a difference between uh, the actual real risk and the perceived risk. And if you can find areas that have a significant spread between the perceived risk and the real risk, now you found an opportunity in which you're going to make a lot of money. Now, in, in this particular case, what you're talking about is wing walking. Wing walking is extremely safe. And I think the way I would, I would be able to best justify it in the shortest time is uh, the amount of premium an insurance company is charging to ensure your life when you're doing that, because some actually is kind of calculated and figured out what's the probability of something going wrong, and it's, it's insanely low. Think of it as freestyle roller coaster riding, but you have kind of a harness, so it's uh, it's pretty safe. Freestyle roller coaster riding at 14,000 feet. No, 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 you do that at two or 3,000, because at 14,000 feet, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you fall from 2,000 feet, you fall from 14,000 feet, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of the same. The landing is the same. The, 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 the end effect might be the same. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's transfer this to a business experience. Yes. Can you give us an example? Are there any other spots? Yeah, so we can see on the face of it really makes so an effect was. I, I think a lot of, um, I think the biggest example I can give is um, is in all the businesses that any of us run, right? Uh, on an ongoing basis, you see market cycles where the market thinks that, oh, there is no risk in it, values are really high. Then the market feels like, oh, this is so risky, and then undervalues it significantly. So you're going to keep seeing that in, in literally every business, not just in my business, but if you look at the public markets, you keep seeing that. But the goal is, uh, as, when you're running the business, how do you stay disciplined, keep growing it uh, on an ongoing basis? Uh, when you know a lot about your own business, and you keep learning and you keep evolving from it, you can identify when 
the markets kind of discounted yeah. the market, the, the businesses in a particular sector Sometimes significantly. I would say that would be the right opportunity for you to go out, use the more just the money that you kind of building, you know, or acquire as many things as possible. You know, and when you think that the market is not understood the risk, at that point of time, you basically uh, don't want to deploy any of that capital and you want to do it organically. drives all of us. I think it's the it's the idea of doing something that is fulfilling, and uh, it, and that's been the case right from the beginning. Like so, I started when I was really young. I, mean, I didn't really need to start that young, but I love doing what I do, and uh, and and people started paying me for it, which is amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, but I yeah, I would love to babies. I love kids, but. Um, uh, I never had the opportunity. Okay, anybody have kids? Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, but um, I think the, the idea is always the same. Like, what do you want to do that? At least in my case, what do I want to keep doing that will keep me learning something new? Because you, you don't want to keep doing the same thing; you get bored of it. You want to uh, you want to keep learning something new, and as you keep learning something new incrementally, you get so specialized and so much better at it uh, that. It's very hard not to succeed in what you're doing. And, well, and you have an interesting way of looking at money, right? I mean, to you, it's a metric. It's, it's I think to most, I, I, so once you cross a certain threshold, at the end of the day, it's a metric, or it's a, it's a, it's a metric to identify whether you're moving in the right direction or not. Because once you start running large businesses, sometimes you feel like you're doing a lot, and you are doing a lot, but you know, at the end of the day, your the numbers. Either show that you're moving up, or you're you're moving down, or you're kind of flat line. And there might be various industry reasons for that, but you have to take a longer term view of that and identify whether you're moving in the wrong, in the right direction. Because there is going to be volatility in any business that you run. There isn't a single entrepreneur that I know that hasn't had volatility. Uh, there isn't a single public company that I know that hasn't had volatility. It doesn't matter which one. So you always see volatility. What you want to see is. Uh, and you use money as a metric for that to identify uh, whether the business is doing well and you're, the the things that you're building, are they really working? Is the market really accepting them? And you see that in the numbers. Have you had anything that failed? Uh, so I think the way I think of it is I'm failing every day until I succeed. And hence, uh, I would say that you know, in all the startups that I started, uh, they've all grown to become one of the largest companies in their industry segments uh, over time. But there were many moments in the middle in that story where things were not working out. And I would say, in my mind, in, you're, you're working on this problem on a daily basis. And on a daily basis, as long as you don't give up, you haven't failed. So in some sense, you can say you're failing every day until you succeed, or you, you've never really failed because you'll keep working on it until you figure it out. So I don't even know what situation is. Um, Why was that? Oh, nice. <laughs> All right, so is there, uh, tell us about, in this brief time you have, your karma theory. Karma theory? Yeah, your karma theory. Uh, I mean, one, I'm agnostic, so yeah, yeah. I don't, uh, 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 my karma theory is, whatever your karma theory is, is that I theory. Uh, oh, so, uh, like so, but you know, at the same time, I, I think that, we have one, I mean, in my mind, I can only see this life, and I can only currently make change to today in a form that I can affect this life. I don't know what I'm doing today could affect another life, if there is another life, and you know, there might be, there might not be, I'm agnostic, I mean, if you reach on. own. Uh, but uh, you want to put in the best today, because that's going to impact your future. Uh, in, in my mind, I think one should do whatever makes them happy, right? So if uh, bumming out on your couch and uh, 
and watching Netflix uh, or chill on Netflix, which is whatever else that means, uh, whatever makes you happy, right? Um, you go do that. Would you ever go to a meeting in a hoodie? Because you're always very well together, right? And in I mean, I, uh, have I ever? Have in, you ever? Um, maybe, but uh, maybe at some point. But it's not like you know, it, again to each their own, right? Everybody has different choices. Um, some people love their a hoodie situation and good for you. Wear what you like. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I like what I'm wearing. Yeah, it's a very nice color. It's also like okay. lovely. Um, <laughs> no, the question I think is because if you're a young person and you're trying to present as somebody to take seriously, you know, showing up in Haleanas, you know, maybe maybe chill. Oh yeah, I, I, there are two theories on that, right? And, and let me let me walk you back then a bit. So I think the the only reason I succeeded when I was really young is nobody saw me uh, because I was this 16 year old kid somewhere uh, it, it, that had a website that you could buy, you know, domains and hosting from. The website looked really professional. So when you looked at the website, you're like, great, this looks awesome. Yeah. And then our client list was the who's who uh, uh, because I had consulted several of them uh, prior to starting this company, so they became my first set of clients. Uh, so I could pitch them in that form. Because there is, a, you know, at least back then, now it's a lot more common where there are young entrepreneurs and they're awesome. Uh, but you know, 20 years ago, uh, the, the idea that, oh, I'm talking to the 16-year-old, should I really trust my site on which I've spent, on my portal on which I'm spending a significant amount of money, uh, should I trust it with these guys? Uh, so I think perception is kind of important from that perspective. Uh, and we have to build a story around that. And the second way to look at it is during dot-com one, I had this funny story around this guy, and he used to always dress in, in, in white, including white shoes and white socks. And people thought that he was quirky. They're like, this guy's quirky, he must be awesome. And they'll put money behind him. So I don't know what works, but whatever works for you, right? So whatever you're comfortable with. It's working. Yeah. Okay. So. And I think on that note, we are done. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Dan. Thank you.